please welcome Mai Nguyen. So I think it's totally on purpose uh, to talk about uh, food yes. before the lunch. So thank you very much for being so... <laughs> Get everybody purpose. hungry. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Mai, and um, thank you to uh, everyone here and the organizers for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, so let's get started. First off, a little bit about myself. I used to do Ruby and Rails development back in the States in DC, and after a while I got tired of it and I took a break to travel and study and work in winemaking. And during that, the next six years I worked in Australia, France, California, and New Zealand. And during that whole time I missed learning new things every day because it's an agricultural vocation, so you have the seasonal aspect and I wanted to keep learning things every day. So recently I've returned to technology and I'm living in Wellington, New Zealand working as a senior developer. So about this talk, let's, the reason I got into machine learning and started learning about it is basically very practical. People always ask me wine questions <laughs> and there are so many kinds of wine and no one knows what they should be drinking and I thought surely there must be some way to automate this. That's why I started learning about machine learning not because it was cool. Uh, <laughs> so, to take a step back, what is machine learning? Well, you can't talk about machine learning without thinking about the broader domain of artificial intelligence, which is making software do smart things, basically. And within that is machine learning, which is it's creating its own models on training data that's not hard-coded rules. And within that, there's deep learning, which is artificial newer networks, and many, la many layers, and you need lots of training data. And then across all of this is natural language processing, which is interpreting language and processing and being voice or text. So, as I said before, machine learning does not rely on coded rules. It creates its own models based on training data, and the two main types are supervised or unsupervised. Supervised where your data examples, your training data have known outputs, and unsupervised where the, the models find the hidden structure in unlabeled data. And of course, there are many types of algorithms for different problems. So there's lots of great things about machine learning. Uh, the accuracy improves as you collect more data. It can be automated and learn automatically. It can be fast, customizable based on your custom data, and it can be scalable depending how you do it. So if it's so great, why aren't more Rubyists using it? And there's some reasons why people might not be using machine learning as much in the Ruby community. One is we really like Ruby and we don't want to write in Python. And it's true, Python is the leading language in data science and there's lots of libraries and lots of uh, tools and support there and Ruby's not so much. I get that. Also, we don't have time. It's a lot of algorithms and it's a whole new domain of science and uh, it may be daunting to try to try something when you don't know anything about it. And then also, I am not a data scientist. Well, I'm not a da data scientist, but that didn't stop me from trying out machine learning and it shouldn't stop you. So to tackle the first one about Ruby uh, and trying to do machine learning inherently in, in Ruby, there are several different resources. Um, there's a, a bunch of machine learning gems and natural language processing gems. Um, I'll share these slides later. Um, there's also a gem called PyCall, which uh, you can call Python libraries from Ruby, so that disconnect of the, the tools not being built in Ruby doesn't need to stop you. And then there's also a community called SciRuby that is trying to build more data science tools with, for the Ruby community. And so we can do machine learning in Ruby, but if you don't want to learn about 
the different algorithms or like get into the details of implementation, there's a lot of APIs that you can use for machine learning and natural language processing. So on this side, I've got machine learning ones, some of the big ones, and on that side, there's natural language processing ones. So it's basically machine learning or natural language processing as a service. And there's a lot of free tiers. I won't go into each one, but there's a lot of options out there for you to try. So if you wanted to get started in machine learning, the there are a few things you need to consider first up. First is what is the question you want to answer? And it's so important to think about this because not every question is machine learning ready and you might have to tweak the way that you're trying to solve your question. What kind of predictions are you trying to really ask for? And then secondly and really, really important is do you have access to good data? And so what is good data? It's representative of future data. It needs to be complete, as in there are not gaps in the data. And it has to have a lot of relevant features or attributes with minimal noise. And the more data, the better. And just a little bit to summarize the machine learning process so it kind of makes more sense. So you've got training data and or you've got a set of data, and then you have um, you can divide into training data and test data, and you prepare them, whether that be cleaning up the data or filling in gaps or figuring out what's relevant, and then you would use the training data set to create your model and training, and then you use your test or cross-validation set to predict and get um, evaluate the performance of your predictions, and through that you would optimize until you get to the level of performance and accuracy that you're looking for in your predictions. So with this, there are lots of challenges with machine learning and people t don't think about. They think, oh, machine learning will do everything. It's, it won't. Um, so some, some major challenges for you to think about before you get started is one, mistakes in your training data can be very hard to spot. For example, if you are using customer-generated data or survey data, it is really difficult to tell when people are lying or stretching the truth on that data, and if you're using that data to create predictions, you may be using erroneous data and may not get the performance you expect. So, as I said, it's about predictions, and so, as a result, 100% accuracy is near impossible. And testing can be very difficult, especially when you consider edge cases where you don't even know what the edge cases could be. And you need to think about whether the future data resembles, like the future things you want to predict on resemble the data that you're currently training on. So if there's diff uh, sharp trends that are, that, that are coming, you need to make sure your data is accounting for that. Also, biases in your training data can be magnified, and it may be difficult to determine a successful outcome. Meaning, if you recommended a movie to somebody, did they choose not to watch it because it's not relevant, or is it because they've already seen it so they don't need it? So. Thinking on that, there are some times when you definitely wouldn't use machine learning. Firstly, if the rules are known, well-defined, and finite. So if you already know the rules, there's no reason you need to set up a machine learning model and run things through predictions that may not necessarily be as accurate as if you already know the rules. So, of course, if you, determine, if you determine that you need very, very high accuracy in machine learning may be difficult for your situation. And if data is unavailable or difficult to obtain, machine learning might not be for you. So with that in mind and these challenges, we're going to explore my practical example of this wine bot that I wrote that explores many challenges in machine learning. So let's see how. So what I wanted was to solve the problem where average consumers, they find wine intimidating and don't know how to select wine for their meals. To solve that, 
I decided to build a chatbot that would educate, entertain, and match wine and food. So breaking that problem down, uh, my happy wine bot will need to converse with users to answer questions. It'll need to understand tastes and flavors of food. It'll need to understand tastes and flavors of wine. And it'll also have to evaluate food and wine pairings together. So let's go through each of these things. First, teaching it to converse. Well, I had to spend a lot of time coming up with chat responses, uh, and then I decided to use a natural language processing API service because natural language processing is really, really hard. So <laughs> let someone else take care of that. And I integrate it with Twitter. So there's a gem for that. And Facebook, there's another gem for that. So pretty simple, straightforward, cool. Um, next on the list is understanding tastes and flavors of food. So that's a little harder. So let's talk about taste first. So you have your mouth, your tongue, and what are the things it can sense? It can sense sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami, and then lately they've been talking about a fatty taste, and also your mouth can sense physical sensations like whether things are spicy or something's cold or hot or crunchy or whatever. And then also you have your nose, which depending on what researcher you're reading, you can sense 10,000 to 1 trillion smells through your nose. And that makes up what our taste sensation is. So there's a lot of things about food that affect the way we perceive its taste. So we've got ingredients, you've got the herbs, the spices, this protein. Also the cooking methods can affect the way things taste. Uh, and those in terms of wine making, or sorry, matching with wine, would impact the taste, the flavors, the textures, the weight, the intensity. These are things that sommeliers think about when they try to pair food and wine. So when we talk about teaching my bot about food, we need to first think about, okay, training data. What kind of training data can I use? And I thought about it and I said, ingredients and cooking methods, they sound a lot like recipes. And so there's a lot of recipes out there, but I need recipes that are complete and detailed so, so that I can give my bot as much information as I can about, and I need to restrict the recipe inputs to selected online recipe sites where I know that they have good quality recipes. And then I'm using my own personal cooking experience to generate my supervised training data. So now I've got data, now I need to train it to create models. So what I decided to do was create one classification model per flavor or attribute of a recipe. So these attributes are chosen specifically for their interactions with wine, and I came up with 50, over 50 attributes I need to predict per recipe to um, determine, to tell my bot, to, so that my bot can figure out exactly how it needs to pair wines. So the, the general goal of this is given any recipe, what will it taste like? So just an example of how I came up with some training data, given a recipe for a hamburger, what kind of attributes will I tell it to be? I think it's salty because it's got these ingredients. It's sweet, sour, bitter from the grilling meat flavors. And that's my training data that I would send for given a recipe, these are the outputs. And that's what I'm training on. Hundreds of recipes doing this manually, me, by myself. <laughs> so, so creating the models and then give, that way, if you give it a recipe, any recipe, given text, it'll find the text, it'll process it and classify the foods. Now, wine, it's a bit more difficult. So there are lots of things about wine that affect the way it tastes and the way people perceive it. Um, and in terms of the inputs of the winemaking decisions and the climate and all that, that all affects the way wine tastes and impacts viscosity, flavor, tannins, acidity, all these things that a sommelier would think about when pairing food and wine. So 
how do I teach a bot about wine? Well, first, let's think about wine data. That's the problem. There isn't very consistent wine information for individual wines. It's not very complete. You look at a wine tasting review, and it just some are short, some are long. It's really not consistent, especially to the degree that I want to pair wines with foods. So I decided to focus on general categories, meaning like Bordeaux, red, champagne, and 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 I relying on my own previous knowledge and experience to create a list of 100 plus wine categories, which I've codified with over 40 different taste attributes for those wines, so that now we can think about how do we match the two together. We know how food tastes, and we know how some wines taste, and how do they go together. So let's think about food and wine pairing. So food and wine pairing, there's different ways that wine and food go together. One is when the wine enhances the food. Another is where the food enhances the wine. And then there's the special chance where you get wine and food enhancing each other and you get a magical experience in your mouth and it's wonderful. This is what sommeliers look for, and this is what I want my bot to do. So how do sommeliers do this? Well, they have strategies that they use for pairing wine and food. Often they'll think about things like they'll match flavor, intensity, and weight. For example, a big, bold, heavy red wine would go well with a big, heavy, fatty steak. They can complement the basic tastes for harmony. So. Sweet foods can go with sweet wines, uh, for example. They can also match and contrast flavors, so maybe like a herbal food with a herbal herbaceous wine. Um, they can also think about the origin of wine and cuisine, and for example, we think pasta and we have Italian wine with that. Sounds good. They also avoid problematic combinations. For example, maybe you have a really spicy dish. You wouldn't necessarily pair it with a heavy alcoholic red wine because the alcohol would magnify the burn of the spice and make it taste less pleasant. So yeah, don't do that. <laughs> so when you're thinking, I'm thinking about how teaching the bot to evaluate these pairings, I've run into the instance where in inherently it's rules-based, and we know the rules, so maybe machine learning is not a good match for this um, application. So I decided to rely on my knowledge, experience, and some literature to create a pairing engine that uses weighted attributes to pair the foods and the wines together. So it's basically a big calculator. So there we got it. All of the pieces of the puzzle have finished, and so we'll just do a quick demo, and hopefully... Um, so this is my Facebook page, and it's got a little get started button, and we'll zoom in so everybody can see, and this is the bot, just say hello, and it'll respond. And so first let's try chatting about wine, and we'll say, do you know any jokes? And why aren't grapes ever lonely? Because they come in bunches. Yes. So next, let's try suggesting a wine match. And what will we be trying? And I just, uh, I love Castulet. <laughs> and so it, it generates a link, and we can see what the wine bot has suggested. So opening up. That and I don't know if you can see it. It's got Rhone reds and different wines. And so it's basically what did it do? It it said, okay, cassoulet. Find me a recipe for cassoulet. Send it to my bot. Bot says, okay, it tastes like these things. And then match it with through my pairing engine. And these are the wine categories it came up with. So yeah, feel free to play with that if you want in your own time. I. Seeing this, um, I hope you can see that if we can take away anything from this experiment and my talk, 
that there are many options to use machine learning in your Ruby stack, and very important to examine the problem you're trying to solve and think about the data that you have available to you and what are you waiting for? Give it a try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so, what is the timing? Did I go too fast? <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. So, uh, we can have uh, some questions. Yeah, please uh, get up if you have questions so we can give you the microphone. Mm -hmm. If you have other questions, please uh, stay up. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Uh, I can imagine that uh, gathering the wine data must be a pain. Um, yes. I have one question, though. I, I saw that you trained 50 separate models yes. uh, for each uh, type of tasting. Yes. Uh, did you do like binary labeling or yes. did you do multi-label? So is it sweet or not sweet? Is okay. It, oh, okay, okay. Is it okay. salty or not salty? Is it crunchy? Is it not crunchy? Okay, okay, I get it. So now it's like a cl classification. It was just simplest to do it that way. I wanted to make oh, sure. Instead so of doing the multi-label, okay. I mean, okay, it, I get it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, if you look at a lot of multi-label things, it's, a lot of solutions, they, it's inherently mm -hmm. like many binary ones together. Yeah, exactly. So I just said, let's just keep it simple. And then that way it's easier for me to see where it's going wrong. Okay. So if it's saying like, oh, it's not category, categorizing chicken dishes correctly, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. then I can zero in and train it on more chicken or more whatever. Uh, and and performance-wise, yeah. performance did you see like it being affected by it or... Uh, it's since I'm doing real-time predictions. It's it is calculative intensity, but it's I mean it's okay, a moment, yeah, yeah. you know. Okay. But I haven't uh, obviously scaled to handle millions of users or, or anything <laughs> like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So please stay up because. If anybody else wants to talk, you have to show it before, so somebody else can come. Hello, uh, thank you and, and uh, thanks for being uh, uh, brave to come to France and mix something as, as wine and science, <laughs> in a risky bet. But, uh, what about uh, Ruby and, and machine learning? What, what are the, who are uh, using that? Who is doing that uh, and why? And what it looks like? Is it just uh, wrappers around things that are done uh, in other languages? Because it seems that uh, machine learning usually needs a lot of uh, machine power, which is not something you kind of have with Ruby. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not... I'm not familiar with how uh, too many other organizations use use Ruby and machine learning, but I feel like at least the purpose of my motivation here is that people in Ruby do not use machine learning, and I feel like people should try it and see it. And and the community, the reason why Python is so popular is they've had over a decade to come up, come up with their libraries and optimize it for the speed or scaling that they want. And, and Ruby did not have the blessing of data scientists corralling around it and trying to support it and build these tools. And so as a result, we are a little bit behind, not a little bit, a lot of bit behind in terms of you know, some of the, the math libraries and things. So, but we can't catch up until we get more people wanting to do it and exploring it. And so that's kind of one of those things. And I think in the end, a lot of people do use cloud services for a lot of these temporary compute power. Like when you're training, you're not training necessarily all the time, you're training to get set up and then, you know, periodically training again to improve. So I think for some of these machine learning as a service, it makes sense to use some cloud, like Amazon 
cloud learning or whatever. Um, but it is, for, for me, I've, I've got local models that I've downloaded and, and put in so that you don't have to worry about API calls. So, but if you, the, it, it depends on your solution or what your problem and what you're trying to solve, really. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one last question. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, surely it's going to be my next wine solution. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question was regarding like your application was mainly built on the rule-based engine, right? Yes. And uh, you define rules based upon the attributes that you have defined in the model and mm -hmm priorities, like how yes. will we selected, right? Yes. But uh, many modern application users, which is using uh, machine learning and LLP as a service, they yes. use this R for this kind of statistical implementation of uh, how this thing is going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, predicted based upon the priorities and all that, but is the chances that it might hit the best uh, options for you and all those kind of stuff. So I don't think Ruby is having those kind of facilities in that. So you have to import from another languages, like you have said, like uh, importing algorithms and all those things in, in Ruby. So is that a plan for your application also to induce these algorithms inside your application and use the best algorithm to find the best rule for, uh, you know, uh, for suggesting a wine and a food pair, not depending on any third party al uh, algorithm from any other languages? I'm actually, it's, it's all native Ruby. So um, I initially used uh, API service to do machine learning because it was easier and I just wanted to get going. And I found with 50 plus m predictions I need to make on each model, it was just taking too long. It just wasn't a good experience. So I had to figure out my own local, because you can download models or, and use them to, to do more faster sorry, faster predictions on through your own local, not local, but through your server, so you don't have to do APIs. Uh, in terms of, I don't, I don't think I would want to take the rules engine and use machine learning on it, because the data isn't there to, to say, okay, this is a thousand wine matches that sommeliers have come up with, and, and to pair that with the food, because I'm, I'm basing it on the tastes of the recipes, and because I want a very flexible solution. So I don't, I don't think I would change anything except for maybe I would experiment with the different types of models that my recipes are being predicted as. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mai. And <laughs>